This is Pivot Out Loud, stories about education and life in a world turned sideways. I'm Lori Huff. I've called all 100 of my 8th graders at least once. The 27 families in my homeroom are now frequently used contacts in my phone. Some families like to chat about the kids' sadness, others about their own disappointment for canceled events and sources of income. The phone being my primary mode of contact does not feel great for my work-life balance. But this is an emergency. By now, my role as literacy instructor and history educator are null. My job is to stay in contact with my kids, to make sure they are safe and healthy. That was always part of the job, but now I'm dependent on all of our cell phones working. Bronx teacher Savati Lelyveld shows us how hard it can be to provide instruction online, especially when a student seems to disappear and the cell phone becomes a lifeline for teaching. This is Pivot Out Loud, and I'm your host, Lori Huff. It's the final week of March. We're doing our best to get a rhythm with remote learning. The city promised Wi-Fi-enabled iPads to alleviate the opportunity gap. Some students have received them. Many are still communicating with teachers via cell phone. I've called all 100 of my 8th graders at least once. The 27 families in my homeroom are now frequently used contacts in my phone. We have a rapport via phone. Some families like to chat about the kids' sadness, others about their own disappointment for canceled events and sources of income. The phone being my primary mode of contact does not feel great for my work-life balance. But this is an emergency. By now, my role as literacy instructor and history educator are null. My job is to stay in contact with my kids, to make sure they are safe and healthy. That was always part of the job, but now I'm dependent on all of our cell phones working. It's the last week of March, and after weeks of calling dozens of families a day, there is a glaring gap in my work. Halima still hasn't logged on to my Google Classroom. The office administrator sent me all of the phone numbers on Halima's emergency card, and after weeks of calling them, I am becoming increasingly worried about the child. Halima is slipping through the cracks that occur when an overexhausted system is asked to work even farther beyond capacity. With no tutor, no Wi-Fi, no guardian at home for dinner time, an overwhelming number of children are relying on our New York City public schools. Towering at least four inches above me, Halima has a personality that can captivate any audience. She is easily identifiable as the eighth grader who can influence an entire cohort of students. Since the first day of school in September, I've had quick conversations with her every morning. Brief reminders that she is smart and beautiful and can lead her whole crew in the right direction. She sits in the first row of class every day, eventually volunteering her drafts for extra feedback and revision. Her focus starts to spill into her other classes. Her grades are improving. She is getting in trouble less often. That was before the pandemic. Now I can't find her. I have had no news of Halima since March 13th, 2020. I've been calling her family for weeks, desperate to verify that she is okay. Finally, I send a text message to all of the contact numbers associated with the child. Halima is missing school. The city will have to come make sure she is okay. I knew those words would be shocking. An uncle called me in response to the text message. I was grateful to be in contact with him. I implored, please, I must make sure Halima is okay. Please ask her mother to call me. Within the hour, I received a phone call from Halima's mother. She didn't know why I didn't have her working cell phone number, but in any case, she has been laid off and is home, full-time. Thank goodness. My relationship with Halima's mother ended up being one of the greatest successes of parent outreach in my eight years as a New York City public school teacher. Halima submitted assignments through her mother's phone until the city delivered the iPad we had requested for her to continue her schoolwork. The iPad arrived six weeks later, and she was able to use it to excel in her schoolwork for the last two months of the school year. Halima's mother and I texted every day to confirm what assignments had been completed or to communicate gentle reminders to get them done. In the month of May and June, Halima was celebrated at our monthly academic award ceremonies as a student who had perfect attendance and near-perfect scores on all of her work. Those last few months of middle school ended on a high note, with Halima's mother having the time and resources to monitor and nudge her daughter's remote learning. Other families, sadly, were not so fortunate. By mid-May, two months into New York City's shutdown, more and more parents are asking for help with groceries. Some say they already receive one form of food assistance, but it's not enough. With so many undocumented workers losing their jobs, more families are sharing already strained resources. Before March 2020, 
Parents had made quick trips to the Caribbean, Central America, and Africa to visit loved ones, say goodbye to elderly generations, check on family members or homes, all things that immigrants do. But now, with lockdowns, restrictions, losses of income, they can't come home to New York City. Cell phones are going out of service. A child who was supervised by an older sibling or neighbor for two weeks is now going on the second month without a parent in the house. The students complain of sleep deprivation, inactivity, depression. The stress is showing on the children. In our Friday social emotional check-ins, they express hopelessness, sadness, and fear for family members who keep our city going as unprotected essential workers. We do our best to continue supporting students through the summer months, connecting families with food pantries and other public health resources. Even as NYC has begun a slow reopening, many families' outlook has not improved, as most jobs and community resources are still closed. It's now the end of July, and I'm still in regular contact with half a dozen of my homeroom students, sharing income and education opportunities as text messages and admiring their tech-savvy emojis and gifts. The resilience of systemically under-resourced communities is not magic, or even luck. It's the power of continuous collective care. Cell phones continue to be the primary mode of communication. When we last heard from Sfati, there were many challenges reaching students, and it was unknown how this would all play out. In October, New York City schools finally did reopen, and I wanted to know what it's been like for her so far. Hi. So we did open on October 1st. The opening day was delayed twice. But finally, students who did opt to be in person started in October. And it's a little bit unusual because we have about two-thirds of our students are 100% remote, meaning that they do not enter the school building at all. And about one-third of our students are in the school building. For the students who are in the school building, it's completely different than anything before. I'm used to teaching in a classroom with 30 students, and it's kind of packed with desks and not a lot of wiggle room. But now there's a maximum of nine students in each class. And actually, almost every day, students are opting out of in-person to go 100% remote. So the classes are getting smaller and smaller. Some of our classes now only have three students in the classroom at a time. Um, So that's one of the biggest differences is that it's like kind of empty. It's not like a, a busy sort of situation, you know, how I experienced public school or, you know, in all my years of teaching. Um, I guess another thing that's pretty different is my advisory is 100% remote. So I have 30 students in my advisory and they work from home every day. We use Google Classroom to meet and Google Meets for 8.30 a.m. meeting every weekday. And we spend advisory just to kind of set the tone and make sure that the students are prepared for their classes and also to give them announcements from the school community. Since my advisory students are 100% remote, I do still use a cell phone to communicate with them often. So I have a number of students and their parents kind of on speed dial almost in my cell phone. And I have them, you know, their text messages are ready to go. So I can say, hey, Juana hasn't joined advisory. It's 845. We started at 830. Does she need a wake up call? That kind of thing. In your essay, you talked a lot about Halima. And for a while, you sort of lost her last spring, and then you were finally able to track down her mother through an uncle, all Mm -hmm. on cell phone. So give us an update on what's happened to Halima, if you know, and do you have any other Halimas that you're having to call a lot this year or that you've lost and you're trying to Mm. find again? Halima graduated. She graduated with fairly strong grades, and she's off to high school in the Middle of September, I did get a lot of calls from a few parents whose children had graduated, including Halima's mother, because they were a little bit confused about the delayed start of school. And I guess they didn't really have a great relationship with whoever they're supposed to be in contact with for their high schools. Really, all I could offer the people who were calling me, my former students and their families, was just to let them know, you know, reach out to your high school. So I haven't heard from her since, but I do hope and assume that she is attending high school and that she's doing okay. I was thinking about reaching out to my former students, probably maybe around Thanksgiving, just to send them a message and, you know, let them know that I'm still here if they need me, especially, you know, Halima and the other students in my homeroom. Uh, This year, I do have a student. It's a little bit different because, you know, last year I had 
gotten to know my students in September and I was with them in person all the way through March. Whereas this year, my advisory students are remote and I've never taught them in person. Some of them, you know, maybe I substituted for them when they were in seventh grade. So I had interacted with them very briefly, but I've never been their full-time in-person teacher before. But I do have a student this year who is home and I think she's mostly unsupervised at home. And it took her about a month to really start logging in to her Google Classroom every day. So for pretty much most of October, because we're already at the very end of October, I was calling her father. I was calling what ended up being a wrong number, trying to reach her mother. I was calling her, trying to get her to log on. And um, there was a little bit of a runaround. Um, You know, I think it's just she's 13 years old, unsupervised at home. And I think she thought that she had more freedom with her schoolwork than she actually does. So there was a lot, a lot, a lot of back and forth, you know, text messages, phone calls, emails. Finally, she is logging on every day to her Google Classrooms, and she has been working really hard to catch up on her missing assignments. I hope that as the year progresses, I'm not going to have to, you know, kind of keep running after her on the cell phone to get her involved and to make sure that she's on time to her classes. This has been her second almost the end of her second week that she's been attending all of her classes. And it seems like she's doing pretty good. So I hope she keeps up with that. You know, one of the things I noticed from your essay and in some of the other essays, this pandemic really brought in some ways a closer tie between teachers and families. Mm -hmm. In some ways, that seems like a silver lining. And I wonder if you see it the same way. Absolutely. I am definitely in touch with families. I mean, you know, parent outreach has always been priority just because we needed to work on it so much, I think, in every New York City public school. And now it's like parent outreach is is our first job. You know, it used to be like we were in the classroom and then if there's an issue or if the kid needs extra support, then we do the parent outreach. But now it's the parent outreach comes first because nothing else can happen without the parent outreach, especially for the students who are 100 percent remote. So definitely, I I have a different kind of rapport with parents. I've been teaching eighth grade for eight years now. And, you know, I like to think that, you know, I know how to talk to young teenagers, even when I see young teenagers who I don't teach, you know, just kids in public who look like, you know, they might need a little bit of guidance so that they don't get in trouble in the street. I always pride myself on knowing how to talk to young people. Um, And I think that's something that I've developed being an eighth grade teacher. And now I think I definitely am developing the skill of knowing how to talk to parents. You know, one thing that's really important is always starting with the positive, you know, letting them know how excited you are to teach their kid. But the other thing is, you know, just listening to the parents. I have a student currently who was absent basically for most of his classes for a day, and he's usually present. I texted his mom to find out what was going on, and it turned out that my student, his sister, and the mom were all sick. They all had a fever, bad cold, and were exhausted. And that's the kind of information that I don't think I would usually get from a parent, you know, were things in person in the same way. So I'm definitely getting more insight into into my my students' home lives than I've ever had before. What are some other ways that this pandemic has ultimately changed you as a teacher? Well, one thing that has been a really big change is the collaboration. So I'm actually working remotely now. I have a student teacher who is in the classroom. She's awesome. And it's actually my first year having a student teacher. Previously, I didn't feel like I had the emotional energy to train another person, but I figured I'm ready for it at this point in my career. And there's also a really great paraprofessional in the classroom. So there are two adults, two educators in person with the students who are in the school building. And then I'm on the smart board using Google Meets. And then I review their work as they're doing it through Google Classroom. So one thing that's an advantage that I've never had before is being able to edit the students' work in real time. Because when students were writing with paper and pencil, They would finish the assignment and then I would give them feedback. Whereas now as they're typing, I can see what they're typing. So I think their writing is progressing a lot more quickly than ever before. And another thing is because the student to teacher ratio is really different now, right? So they had to create a lot more social studies classes, eighth grade social studies classes. So there are a few teachers at my school teaching eighth grade social studies for the first time. And they're actually using the curriculum that I created, which I'm really proud of. And 
What it means is that in addition to training my student teacher, I'm also working with other adults who are experienced teachers, but in other subjects and other content areas. And I'm also writing my lesson plans in a way, not just so that I can teach them, but so that other people can teach them and other people can learn more um, pedagogical strategies through my lesson plans. Svati Lelyveld, thank you for joining me on this rainy day. Thank you. That was Savati Lelyveld discussing how the pandemic altered her teaching. I'm Lori Huff, the editor of Ed Magazine and the host of Pivot Out Loud by the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Thank you for listening.